Hi everyone and uh, welcome to the next in our webinar series with the IUSCA. Um, thanks for joining us and um, today uh, we've got Griffin Waller uh, from the University of Portland. Griffin's the Director of Sports Performance there, uh, directly overseeing all of the teams and athletes um, and has a, has a lot of hands-on work with men's basketball in particular. Um, Griffin's published through the IUSCA um, on return to play, which he's going to go through today. Um, and he, you know, he's got some fantastic ideas and research and evidence base behind him. So he'll take us through all of that and, and, and will give us a little opportunity to, to ask some questions on that as well. Um, the, the department at University of Poland is also endorsed through the IUSCA um, with our external evaluation process. Uh, and they were one of the first universities to go through that, uh, which demonstrates some of the, the great work uh, Griffin's doing in the area. So um, I'll, I'll hand over to Griffin and let him let him get straight into it. Thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to present to all you guys. It's it's a topic I know is is pretty prevalent <clears throat> in the field now, and um, there's a lot of ideas around it. And I'm really excited to kind of give you my uh, my take on it <clears throat> and how I excuse me how I've um, addressed it here at University of Portland. So I have a lot of uh, a lot of slides to get to. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, one second. All righty, so <clears throat> a little bit about uh, kind of before we dive in, um, just a disclaimer, it's all this information is, is based on review of literature, discussions I've had with industry professionals and just my own experience. <clears throat> Like I want to say, I'm not I'm not a doctor, physical therapist, or anything. I just I want the the best information to be out there and 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 be accurate and um, informative for all of you. Um, and I'm not actually currently integrating this full system. I'll get into it here in a, <clears throat> in a bit. But uh, I've I've been in a unique situation at University of Portland with with some of the the conflict between sports performance and sports medicine. I know that's not a new thing. Um, we're currently in the process of hiring a new head of ATC, so it's a new opportunity for me to try to present this information uh, to him and, and, and our staff with sports, uh, sports medicine and try to come to a common, common ground on how we apply these principles in, in, in an integrated fashion. Uh, so the aims are just to offer ways of considering structuring and planning and executing a return to play process. Uh, question uh, contemporary practice, reinforce current literature, and, and ultimately enhance long-term athletic development. So the foundation, where do we start? Okay, and it call, all comes down to the human factor. And like I just mentioned, uh, with, you know, we're working in different departments, there's a lot of stakeholders in place. Uh, we can't always choose who we work with, um, but human beings are our biggest assets. We want to make sure that we integrate that team behind the team, if you will, and improve those relationships and, and, and foster those relationships in terms of applying this system uh, in order to, to maximize it. We can have the best possible program in place, but if we don't have those relationships um, that, are, that are enable, enable us to coach it effectively, and enable us to create that systematic approach, then it kind of falls flat. Um, and there's a lot of research behind this. Team member relationships at work have been shown to be directly associated with organizational commitment and job performance. So being able to understand yourself first uh, and foremost, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, who you are as a practitioner, who you are as a human being can kind of help and guide you uh, to be a better, uh, a better team member um, and coach and investing time really um, in order to build those relationships, we got to invest time into our student athletes, invest time getting to know our coworkers on a personal level and a professional level. Um, Cause before all that, like I said, before we integrate a program, if we don't have those solid relationships and that foundation in place, it's going to be really, really hard uh, to fully integrate that system. 
And then understanding your athletes and team members, personality types, attitudes, and behaviors, how you approach these relationships, how you approach, you know, one athlete versus another athlete or um, one stakeholder versus another, understanding how they interpret inf information, the language you should use, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's all important, uh, ensuring that you're always moving forward and progressing in the right direction. And those four books on the side, those have been really impactful for me. If you don't know them, I highly suggest reading them. Uh, they've been really beneficial in terms of how I've uh, approached a lot of these um, relationship building at work and in my personal life. Um, so once a big part of those improving relationships is just improving communication. Um, and in a recent study investigating communication between medical staff and coaches in elite European soccer showed that injury rates were uh, substantially higher in those who had poor communication, just emphasizing the importance of of low quality communication, how that can impact uh, return to play protocols and just injury rates within sport. And in a, and in a field where there's, there's multiple stakeholders and multiple disciplines, you know, everyone can interpret information differently. So if we can come to terms with, okay, a common ground, knowing our audience, keeping it super simple, how I interpret information, how our sport medicine practitioner does, how the sport coach does, how can we come to a common ground and how can we come to common language to make sure that nothing's being misinterpreted, right? Um, a big component of that is mandatory meetings. So once an, an injury occurs, understanding, okay, where are our touch points? How can we con uh, consistently meet to address, you know, that given week uh, in our protocols moving forward? Uh, and in those meetings, I mean, when you have people with egos, which is a lot of time in this field, you know, it's, it's not about trying to trump somebody else. It's, it's controlling our emotions. It's, it's listening. It's using feedback. It's, it's all about collaboration. Um, so it's putting our egos on the back burner for the betterment of, of the student athlete or the athlete we're working with. Um, and then making sure that we're consistent with that, following up through, um, you know, future meetings, having documentation in place, being able to keep each party accountable for their for their roles and responsibilities. So within the multidisciplinary team, you know, it, where there is ego involved, you know, every discipline is valuable. We want to make sure, like in, in, in my situation, we kind of have our what we call our triangle, which is sports performance, sports medicine, and our sport coach, who are the three main prongs with the student athlete at the center. Um, and everyone's situation is a little bit different but we wanna be as inclusive as possible. Everyone is valuable. What they bring to the table is valuable. What their strengths are, are, are maybe more than what you can provide. So we wanna make sure that we're leaning on, on our, our team members as much as possible. Uh, and we're taking ego out of the equation. Uh, on the left, the 2016 consensus statement. If you haven't read this paper, <clears throat> I highly suggest reading it. It's been a huge, hugely influential on me in terms of how I address return to play. Um, and they go into detail about documenting and outlining roles and responsibilities of the multidisciplinary team. Uh, on the right, that's, it's from Sue Falsoni's book. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of gray area and overlap of our roles. So once again, having a better idea of, okay, what are our roles and responsibilities? Where do they kind of uh, overlap? Um, how do we shift from one uh, practitioner to the next practitioner? So understanding those, those undulations is really, really important. There's not any hard stops um, or absolutes. And the consensus statement does say like coming up to a def definition of who's working within this and what are their roles and responsibilities. These are definitions I don't have to get into detail about. I, I know you all know kind of what are the, those roles in particular, but I think it's still important to make sure that we understand like, okay, what exactly is our athletic trainer supposed to do? What am I supposed to do as a performance coach? What is our sport coach's role? And do they understand that? Uh, and roles within return to play, right? Like how is that narrowed within a return to play focus? Uh, and the big thing is just collaboration communication. And that's that's where the, the human factor comes into place. The relationships come into place. Our, our communication standards come into place. Um, so what those roles are may be different for you versus me and in our environments. But nonetheless, it's very important for us to understand and all parties to understand like, what exactly is my role within this process? So moving into to creating a framework uh, and it's consensus statement does say, um, 
adopting models to return that process is vitally important. So that's just what we're going to do. And the number one thing is keeping the athlete as the focal point. I've, I've literally had in the past athletic trainers put themselves as the focal point as if they're the ringleader, um, et cetera. You know, I think we need to avoid that at all costs. We're here to serve the athlete uh, and, and putting the athlete's best interest in mind is, should be the main focus. There needs to be that mutual respect and understanding of everyone's role, which is why we need to outline those roles and responsibilities. And we need to use evidence and best practice as much as possible to guide that decision making. But at the end of the day, we can't lose sight that the athlete is heavily involved. I think that can be an oversight. Sometimes we get so involved in the process that we often don't allow the athlete to be a part of that. They need to be invested. They need to have their goals outlined. They need to be um, completely understanding what their injury is and what the process looks like and potential timelines involved. Uh, a big part of that, and I love this graphic from King, um, understanding maximizing athlete involvement, uh, educating them on the injury process and allowing them to be an active participant. Um, so part of that is like when we schedule regular meetings with, with the multidisciplinary team, you know, at times the athlete needs to be involved in that. So they understand what the process is like and it allows there to be consistent feedback. Uh, and then a the reconditioning model, this is based on Bill Knowles um, and uh, his book, and the big part of this is understanding an injury is just a small part of, of the process. Just because they're injured doesn't mean that we can't or we halt all athletic development. So we want to make sure it's, it's a performance-based and medically supported model for continuing their development. And we're still addressing all aspects of development within the return to play process. So if there's an ankle injury or even an upper extremity injury, regardless of where the injury is, we want to make sure that we're continuing their long-term athletic development and maintaining or progressing those qualities, even during a return to play process. And that should be our mindset. So we're always training around injury, hopefully avoiding prolonged immobilization as much as possible. And we're re and, and it helps to integrate the medical team and the sports performance team within this process. So we're not kind of um, working in silos, if you will. Criterion performance-based method, uh, if you haven't checked out uh, the checklist manifesto from Atul Gwande, it's really good in terms of what is our process, what is our steps um, as we progress through return to play and using criteria as much as possible to guide our decision-making. Um, so we're not just guessing on what's going on. We have an idea of what are our progressions, what are our checkpoints, what do they need to accomplish prior to moving forward to the next stage of return to play and adding in more complexity um, there's a recent study on, uh, ACL injury and they found that athletes who, um, who used a checklist and criteria within return to play decreased their chance of re-injury significantly. So that's what we want to do is decrease the chance of injury and improve their application once they return to full competition. Cause in the old model, a lot of times a timeline would be put in place, right? And that's not optimal. Everyone recovers at a different stage. Uh, there's just, there's not a, there's, uh, there's no, you can't put a square peg in a round hole, right? Like how we adapt to injury and how we tolerate stress is very individual. Um, so we wanna make sure that we individualize the return to play process as much as possible. And at the end of the day, it helps overlook, make sure that nothing gets overlooked, right? Uh, so we have these, these stages in place and these criteria that we have to meet, it ensures that there's best practice and the student athlete is not being rushed through the process. And then the consensus statement also uh, touches on this as well, ensuring that we have this graded criterion based progression that is applicable for any sport and is aligned within our return to return to sport goals. Shared decision making um, in the in this kind of outdated old model, you know, the doctor athletic trainer would make that decision. I think in this new model where we have a lot of stakeholders and a lot of professionals involved that could provide a lot more perspective, it's, it should be shared, including the athlete. Um, so the decision to further progress the athlete needs to be a shared decision by all contrib contributing members. It creates a lot of structure and transparency within a complex system. It ensures that risk is assessed by everybody including the athlete uh, <clears throat> and everyone's in agreement within their, 
you know, within their fields that the athlete is, can safely move on to the next stage or safely return to sport without there being a risk of, of injury. And what that looks like is the athlete is more mostly subjective in regards to how they perceive their injury, how do they feel? And I think that's a big component because if they don't feel confident within their injury uh, or how they feel as they get back into sport, then that's a, that's a big deal. Even if they've biological healing has occurred and they've hit the performance metrics that we, that we deem important. Um, healthcare professional, which I include sports performance within that is more objective. Have they, have they um, reached the performance metrics that we deem valuable? Like I said, have they, um, is, uh, is all the orthopedic testing, is that, is that cleared by the doctor and the athletic trainer? Is all that good? And the coach is mostly contextual. How do they look within their sport tactically, technically? Because um, they're the ones that are best served to evaluate uh, sports skill. And then within that context, and then within all that, we can make a decision if, if the athlete is completely prepared for a return to full competition. And once again, return to, to sport, uh, the 2016 consensus statement indicates the same thing in regards to making sure it's a shared decision within all parties. Uh, and regarding that, the start framework is really good in terms of how do we assess risk? Because um, we all may differ on whether an athlete is sufficiently prepared. Uh, and then the start framework is really good in terms of, okay, what is the process? How do we, how do we ensure that the minimal risk uh, and there's a lot of, of factors involved. So it kind of walks us through that. Uh, and what that looks like, uh, step one, is the tissue prepared to tolerate that stress? Is there biological healing, uh, orthopedic testing? How is their tissue health? Uh, step two being what the tissue stress, can they tolerate performance testing? What is their sport position? Psychologically, are they prepared? And then the last one being like uh, risk tolerance modifiers. So that could be timing and seizing, see, timing and within the season, pressure, fear. Uh, so for example, if we have a senior student athlete who's coming back from you know, a grade two or three ankle sprain, this is, they're gonna retire after the season, they're done, they're not playing any further and it's a playoffs, you know, maybe we would push them along faster than someone who's a sophomore that has a substantial playing career ahead of them. You know, so context is really important in regards to that. So using that, we can kind of create a plan. Um, so using those models, we'll, we'll narrow our focus into creating a plan for a optimal return to play. And I think the number one thing is understanding what is our objective, like actually writing that down. Uh, I know it seems minimal, but I think that's important for everyone to understand, like, what is our objective? What are our goals? And how is that helping guide our decision making through the process? So ultimately, I took all that information and, and my definition that we came up with uh, is a return to performance, which is an athlete centered criterion based and shared decision making model to prepare, prepare this and sustain athletes for a return to competition. So very matter of the fact, simple, uh, but everyone understands what our goals are and what our objectives are as it relates to returning the athlete back. Uh, and we can't uh, measure what we don't test. And that's going to be a big portion of how, how we guide our, our decision-making. What are the, what are the criteria in place? Um, so testing can be very different depending on your environment, depending on your populations, depending on your sport, what you deem valuable. Um, but I think ultimately it's understanding the demands of the sport we're working with and choosing tests that provide us the most information and creating an environment that's repeatable and and valid and reliable so what tests you choose ultimately comes down to what you deem important for that athlete in that sport and your environment but the 2016 consensus statement demonstrates the importance of these tests to, to guide our decision making to guide our our criterion based um progression and 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 adding tests that are validated to ensure that our decision making is appropriate uh and what those tests are like i said really depends this these are just a few that I've, I've written down that we use a lot at University of Portland um, and trying to hit every, every pillar of performance being movement, strength, power. Uh, we're fortunate to have force plates that we can use um, our speed and our agility, uh, energy system development, and just functional and joint uh, range of motion and mobility uh, assessment. So 
uh, making sure that those tests are repeatable and, and revisiting those throughout the process as uh, part of our, our criterion and checkpoints. Um, the performance model, which is Bill Knowles and slide framework, uh, which is Sue Falsoni. I'll, I'll get into that here in a second, but those are two, uh, two books I've used a lot, um, but they help develop a plan because we wanna make sure that we always work backwards from what is ideal? Where are we trying to get the athlete back to? Um, okay, we know they're, a, a, for example, a basketball player and a guard, um, so they're going to cover more distance. They're going to handle the ball. Um, they're going to have a lot more change of direction. So what do they need to accomplish on the court? Uh, and then how do we work backwards from that and to create a plan to progress them through return to play? Um, ultimately, it's about protecting the injury, guiding the healing process, work uh, training around their injury prior and as we get into the re reconditioning model and using testing and assessment uh, as our objective criteria to progress through each stage. So as I alluded to the performance model on the left through Bill Knowles uh, and Sue Falsoni on the right. Uh, so there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of gray area as we shift through different stages. Um, if you haven't read these two books, along with the 2016 consensus statement, these, those three pieces of literature are the most used for me uh, and have been pretty influential in guiding uh, and informing my process here. So I highly suggest uh, diving into those. Um, another uh, component is monitoring the process. Uh, ultimately, just being able to protect the athlete, meeting them where they're at, having some objectivity to how they're tolerating the stressors we're putting on them from start to finish. Um, so having this loaded grade, uh, load progression really helps to ensure that we're not putting the athlete at undue risk. Uh, gives us a lot of feedback and how we're planning and periodizing our training, how we're quantifying what they're actually doing and ensuring the athlete is, is trained enough to move on to the next stage or add more, more load or impact or um, volume. So what that looks like for us is um, we don't have a ton of technology, so we do what we can, the most with what we can. We use uh, RPE and acute chronic workload a lot to measure uh, load progression. It's just a way, subjective way to monitor internal load and assess acute, acute load over the rolling average of the previous four weeks. And the big thing is avoiding the big peaks and valleys. So we just give them the board rating scale it, it puts a lot of autonomy on the athlete themselves because they have to be truthful, but hopefully we built that rapport and that trust with the athlete that we feel comfortable giving them a scale and having it be accurate. Um, if you don't know uh, Tim Gabbett's work on this, he's kind of the, the go-to guy. Uh, I'd suggest reading, some, he has a lot of literature on it. Um, and ultimately through the consensus statement, they mentioned being able to have a uh, assess their workloads and ensure that they're prepared for uh, uh, higher loads as they progress through return of play. Uh, and what that looks like is we want to avoid those peaks and valleys. So staying in that sweet spot of about 0.8 to 1.3, uh, just ensuring that the athlete uh, isn't hit with too much volume, too much intensity too early on. And that's where that uh, session RPE can come into play. And we can kind of overlay that with all the other stuff that we're tracking. Um, another subjective uh, uh, data point that we use are the wellness questionnaires. Pretty simple. We give them, we send them a text message. It's a quick, not even 30 second uh, questionnaire, five questions looking at sleep, duration and quality, stress, fatigue, mood, soreness, uh, just looking at how their overall well being and how they're tolerating what we're doing. Uh, and we can kind of overlay that. Uh, there's a lot of information uh, out there on the validity to this how it can provide context to what we're doing, um, how the athletes tolerating the stresses that we're putting on them. Uh, so those subjective ratings of wellness appear sensitive to changes in load and individual circumstances and provide a useful tool to monitor adaptive responses. So what that looks like for us is what are the trends? Um, so we can look at like where their sleep qualities look, uh, what their sleep quality looks like, how long they're sleeping, are there big fluctuations in body weight? Um, what their stress is, whether athletically or academically or socially, mood, fatigue. And we kind of use that to create more dialogue, create more communication, where are areas that we may need to address 
um, it just gives us a bigger, well-rounded picture of, of, of them. Um, some external load that we can look at, as I alluded to before, we're fortunate we have some force plates, um, which gives us a lot of uh, information in terms of what their quote unquote movement signature would look like. Um, so we use this a lot in terms of seeing how much force they can, that can be applied into the ground and, and how long it takes to apply that force. Uh, hopefully we've been able to get these metrics prior to them getting injured. So we have a baseline of what that looks like uh, in terms of maybe their overall stiffness score um, or their, their physical limiters from a performance standpoint where there might be a, a, a limiter from a readiness standpoint. So we can look at those two in terms of, okay, we need to address these physical limiters from performance, or maybe they come in and they have a poor jump metric from, from a break, uh, eccentric braking where, okay, well, maybe they're really fatigued and we need to drop or modify their training um, based on that information. So all this is, is taken in conjunction with each other. Another tool we use, um, we, have, we are fortunate to have a bunch of push bands. So we use those as an accelerometer to measure movement velocity in a lot of different movements. Um, and it's a great way to create objectivity and the individuality within our training process. Um, the big thing here is creating a little bit more specificity, especially as we get into later stages of return to play, as well as auto-regulation. If we're trying to hit specific um, uh, strength speed or speed strength or what you will, numbers, you know, it allows us to see, okay, well, are they hitting those numbers? Do we need to modify their training? Do we need to drop volume or intensity based on the fact that they're not hitting the numbers we need them to hit or, or what we expected them to hit? Um, well, I think one of the most overlooked aspects is their psychological readiness. Uh, we all know injury is a lot more than physical. And when we look back at the start framework, and one piece of that was when we assess risk is what their psychological state is. Do they do they mentally prayer, feel prepared for uh, a return to sport and a return to competition? So it's really crucial that we take into account their psychological readiness and their mental performance. Because a lot of times there's a fear of re-injury or they're regaining status on the team if they're you know, looked at as their, the starting point guard. And now they're, they had a severe knee injury and there's just less confidence with how, what their st standing is on the team. There might be avoidance right? They may try to avoid that, that side of their, uh, if it's a, you know, a right knee injury, they may be avoiding that side of their um, loading into that leg at all. So there's a lot of uh, complexities and variables in place. Psychological readiness is very important. We just want to make sure that we provide and evaluate that uh, consistently and to ensure that that is, that they're prepared for the demands of sport. So we will integrate this at every stage within return to play. So we're constantly looking at this objective number uh, immediately post injury through each stage of the process and post return to play as a way to consistently evaluate what their mental state is. And it's pretty simple, it doesn't take very long and it gives us an objective number that we can work off of. So we take all that into our return to performance continuum. I labeled it a continuum. Uh, Sue Falsoni labels it the same way. I, I think where there's no clear lines and um, I think it's important to know it's, it's a bandwidth, uh, things can move and fluctuate given the context and variables at play. So uh, once someone reaches a certain stage, you know, there's the ability to move back and forth depending on how they're tolerating and uh, moving through the process. So a lot of what this is, is based on the 2016 consent statement um, we're integrating all members and, and with including the athlete, we're creating a standard operating procedure and objectivity within the process. And like I said, there's no absolutes, but we're using the criteria as a checklist and a roadmap as much as possible. So stage one or phase zero would be our initial consultation. Uh, to me, this is the most important part because this is where we can get everyone in the same room. Uh, we can understand what the actual injury is. Um, so once we know the injury, if it's a surgical injury, obviously where we'd be starting at, you know, stage one of return to play, if it's a minor, um, a minor injury or an injury that maybe they're only out for four to six weeks, then maybe they're not starting at stage one, maybe they're starting at stage two or three, depending on, you know, what, uh, what we deem is important and the, the 
uh, return to play process, how that aligns. So we want a clear and understanding of the injury. It allows us to collaborate on all interventions from each discipline, working backwards to create that plan and using our testing to provide clear direction. Uh, this is a, uh, a vital part to educating and empowering the athlete. So using that graphic uh, infographic from King to allow the athlete to be a part of the process, understanding what that looks like for them, what the injury is, what their goals are. They need to be completely invested in it as much as possible. Uh, and this is where we can set our weekly meetings, standard our, standardize our communication, um, how, uh, how all of our disciplines are being aligned and integrated through that process. Uh, and, and considering all factors in play, right? Type of mechanism of injury, sport and position, what is the time of the year, uh, physical and mental status of the athlete. So using that psychological readiness scale, uh, what is the stress and emotions involved and what pressure may be involved? Because we know those are important variables to consider as well. So as we get into uh, return to participation, this is just an uh, excerpt from the 2016 consensus statement, which would be our, our phase one. The athlete may be participating in rehab training, uh, modified or unrestricted or in sport, but at a lower level in his or her return to sport goal. The athlete is physically active, but not yet ready medically, physically, and or psychologically to return to sport. So using that, this would mostly be um, ATC derived. So this is where a lot of our biological healing will take place, um, promoting tissue healing, restoring homeostasis, promoting joint range of motion, tissue firing, trying to minimize pain as much as possible. But around that, you know, sports performance is going to be training around that injury, right? We're trying to integrate the injury as much as possible when it's apply applicable, but we don't want to take the athlete out of training. We don't want to take the athlete out of practice. So sports performance will be training around that injury, avoiding deconditioning, uh, trying to integrate when, uh, when appropriate, reintegrate that tissue back into training while the sport coach is keeping the athlete engaged in practice, engaged in meetings. Maybe if it's a lower limb injury, they can still do controlled, um, isolated skill work, such as, you know, seated in a chair, form shooting, something like that, where they're still working on skill development that's not uh, negatively impacting the injury, but keeping them involved within their sport and with all involved within with the team. Uh, so this is from uh, Bill Knowles' book, but I think a good quote that I love from him is, is close enough, good enough. We may need to focus less on what could go wrong and think more of what could go right. And that goes around, that we, I think we're, we pull kids out too early and we get negative, themselves included, on, on the injury. It's a traumatic event for a lot, of, a lot of these kids. So how can we be positive? How can we focus on what they can do, uh, what they can do versus what they can do? Uh, phase two, this is heavy collaboration with sports performance and the sport coach. So, or I'm sorry, uh, sports performance and sports medicine. So this is going to be continuing the activation, a lot of neuromuscular control and joint range of motion and mobility, uh, and continue to monitor tissue quality and tissue health, how they're adapting to these stressors where sports performance is starting to progress our general strength, uh, preparing for things like deceleration and change of direction progressing our generous general fitness qualities, uh, progressing physical, physical literacy and movement progressions, uh, force, as we get into building some strength, we're getting into force absorption, force production. So our plyometric progressions going into like an introduction, going into landing mechanics, then moving into extensive jumping, intensive jumping, return to progression, uh, return to running. So things of that nature. So, um, this stage has a lot in it, um, as you can see. So, uh, just making sure that we know what our progressions are, what the athlete needs to do before we increase complexity, before we increase intensity and volume, uh, the sport coach continues to keep the athlete involved. Uh, once again, depending on what they're capable of doing with the ATC and myself, uh, the court, the sport coach is mirroring that on the court. So if we're into doing some basic plyometrics, uh, introduction, and uh, jump mechanics, then maybe the sport coach is being uh, allowing him to do form shooting standing or some sort of standing dribbling ball handling where we can get that athlete to do some sport technical sports skill without putting the injury at risk. Um, as you can see with 
Sue Falsoni's uh, progression, this is kind of where things evolve into more performance enhancement. So like I said, heavy collaboration between myself, sports medicine, sport coach, we have to make sure that everyone's on the same page about what the athlete can do and creating a progression that is optimal for their development. So as we progress into stage three, this is our return to sport. So now the athlete is increasing a little bit more specificity as it re relates to their sport. Um, the athlete has returned to his or her defined sport, but is not performing at his or her desired performance level. Some athletes may be satisfied with re reaching this stage and it's at, this can represent successful return to sport for that individual. Obviously we want to progress them back to full uh, competition. It just context dependent on that student athlete. That's where the psychological readiness is important. Um, but what that looks like, this is more uh, integrated functional adaptation as we get into more sports specificity. Uh, so heavy collaboration now shifting to myself and the sport coach where the um, athletic trainer is doing, sorry, that's my dog. Kilo. Um, so that's where the uh, athletic trainer is more so just looking at how the athletes tolerating stress, how they're adapting to the stressors and, and the progressions of our return to play where the sports performance coach is looking into more so progressing our strength that we got into stage two into strength and power progressing our, uh, progressing our plyometrics from you know extensive into intensive so increasing some intensity there progressing our running into acceleration and and max velocity uh getting into some change of direction controlled close skill into open and uh open skill and un, unregulated skill and then in, in this would be a, a perfect opportunity to integrate contact so using basketball again as an example you know a guard or even a big you know they're going to be taking contact under the rim or on the perimeter so how can we integrate that to ensure that they're prepared to take contact when they're on the court so this is where we can integrate a lot of uh, the sport coach understanding what we're trying to accomplish understanding the demands of the position uh, what they need to accomplish to make sure that re-injury is mitigated as much as possible as we get into more and more sport specificity and then the last stage return to performance this is working into full full participation into competition the athlete has gradually returned to his or her defined sport and is performing at or above his or her pre-injury level for some athletes, this stage may be characterized by personal best performance or expected personal growth as it relates to performance. So this is once again, going to be heavily sport coach and sports performance as the athletic trainer more so is looking at how they're tolerating our stressors and adapting to the stimuli. Um, so we're getting into more of a sport specific position, specific skills and patterns, progressing sport specific fitness. Um, so we're trying to expose them to a variety of stimuli looking into integrating more uh, open react, working towards more open skill development, reactive skill development. Uh, so progressing exposure to contact, progressing situational games to small sided games, to modified scrimmage and ultimately full scrimmages. Uh, within the weight room, we're looking at hopefully getting in to within 10% of their strength, mobility, power, speed standards, uh, our conditioning standards as it relates to their sport. Uh, the big thing is emphasizing the shift to sport specific and making sure that they can tolerate that change of direction uh, from a reactive standpoint. Uh, and that's what we're going to see within uh, the sport coach role, which is vital to understanding how they look on the court. Can they, um, can they change direction in a unpredictable manner? Can they take contact on the court? Um, and that's where that sport coach can provide that context. So to recap, uh, a big component, like I mentioned in the very beginning, is collaboration. So having those relationships uh, uh, as the foundation uh, and have a program of escalating demand, using that clearance criteria uh, in our performance testing to guide our return to play, uh, using uh, monitoring as much as possible, so our external and internal load, using that psychological readiness scale to ensure the athlete's mentally prepared, using the athlete-centered model to keep the athlete as the focal point, uh, using the START framework and shared decision-making mo models to evaluate risk and ensure that everyone's on the same page, 
uh, maintaining those weekly meetings, having open lines of communication so we can discuss that weekly plan and ensuring the athlete understands what is involved and what they need to do and keeping them uh, invested in the process. And then the last stage would be, how did we do? Uh, so this, I deem this just as important as the first stage uh, is auditing the process, continuing to find ways to refine and improve our protocols. Um, each member, including the athlete, should be an active participant in how that process can be improved. So take home points for me. Uh, I, the big thing for us here at University of Porn is we want to be open-minded. We want to never stop learning. Um, want to always make sure that we're investing in ourselves and in the people we work with in our relationships, both personal life and in our professional lives. Uh, minimizing ego uh, and, and maximizing our collaboration and working together. Using best practice uh, and current research to ensure that we're doing what is, what is optimal for the student athlete. Uh, making sure we always have a plan and knowing that it's not always going to be linear, but um, having a plan to make sure that we, we ensure best practice for our, for our athletes and creating a system that fits your environment and your population. What works for me and my population may not work for you. So I think at least using the models outlined here uh, and some of um, the principles that I've outlined can at least give you some structure to what may work for you and your environment. Uh, if you'd like to look at some, uh, some of the sources that I have cited, feel free to reach out to me. I can forward those to you. Uh, I want to thank all my student athletes, Andrew and the IUSCA for the opportunity. A lot of my colleagues that I've worked with over the years who have, who have allowed me to be put in this position. And contact information, if you want to reach out, email, Instagram, feel free. I'm an open book. Um, that's all I got. Uh, feel free to ask questions or um, whatnot, but I, hopefully that was that was informative uh, for you and that uh, you were able to take at least a little bit of something from that. Thanks, Griffin. There's um there's one question already I think came in about halfway through just um, in the Q and A box. If you can see that, Griff. Uh, do I unshare my screen? Uh, you you can do. I don't know how to. There should be um. There should also be a Q and A box at the bottom. You should be able to see. Let's see here. Oh, here we go. What What should be the criteria for transferring athlete from physio rehab to strength conditioning performance? Any special specific checklist? So, uh, I don't. If you mention, if you remember that graphic I had, um, from. Sue Falsoni. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, how do I? Sorry, I might. It's the one that had the um, the lines drawn across, and it had the overlapping roles and responsibilities. I don't know. Um, I, I think the criteria is really dependent on what the injury is, uh, and who is involved in the process. So like what their criteria for uh, ankle dislocation versus an ACL versus uh, shoulder subluxation is gonna be different. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's understanding from the physio or the athletic trainer has biological healing occurred. Is there hopefully minimal to no pain? And do we have full uh, active range of motion? I think those three would be the, the big three for me in terms of can that athlete at least tolerate some loading, hopefully. Um, so I don't know if it's a, it's a black and white answer there, but I would say the, the big components would be minimal to no pain. Uh, do they have, uh, do they have active full range of motion and can they, what, what are their strength tests look like for, within that tissue or um, if it's a tissue injury. So what are our tests to evaluate that? And that would be, that's not necessarily my, my forte, right? That's a little bit out of my scope. So hopefully you have that relationship with, with your physio or your ATC to understand that the athlete homeostasis has been reached and biological healing has occurred that we can move into integrating that tissue back into their long-term athletic development and reconditioning model. 
Uh, next question, is it better for one person to have overall oversight or can it work with equal collaboration? Equal collaboration, in my opinion. Um, I think when you get into one person overseeing everything, that's where, uh, that's to me where ego can come into place and someone feels that they would be able to trump somebody else. Uh, I like to think we're all on an even playing field. So within my environment, that would be our sport coach, myself, and the athletic trainer. We're all on an even playing field where all of our input is, is weighed equally. Um, obviously, during different stages, we may shift from one person to the other in terms of who is mostly taking control over that stage. It doesn't mean that the other person's input isn't valuable or their contribution is overlooked but we are still actively participating equally. We are actively collaborating and actively communicating at all stages and including the athlete. So in my experience, I think that everyone should be equally uh, looked at as an equal participant versus um, having one person over everything. Any, uh, any other questions you think, Andrew? I think that's the only two that have come in. Um, so we'll see, see if any more come in just, just now. If not, um, thanks, Griff, obviously, for, for presenting today. I, you know, I found that really, really useful. And I think some of those links to the key research and everything else will be a great starting point for, for a lot of people on this to, to go and you know, check out some of, the, some of the current stuff out there and figure out how they can implement that into... In, into their own practice because I think I think it's an area that is overlooked a little bit outside of you know some of the top professional teams and uh, people struggle to figure out how to work well with the sports coach with the physio uh, yeah. athletic trainer and everything else and how to implement it so yeah I really really appreciate that today Griff and um, thank you for coming on absolutely yeah I, I would agree uh, just to, as a closing point it's and that's why I put that human factor in relationships as a number one, because it just makes it, it's very difficult to have any sort of system in place if we don't, aren't able to work together. And uh, I think for me in the beginning, when I first got here, there's a lot of conflict between myself or the sports performance department and the sports medicine department. So when I was, my initial goal was I just need to repair the relationship, right? So there's a lot of things I didn't agree with. Um, I would just bite my tongue and try to build that trust and rapport. And over time, I was able to push a little bit more and push a little bit more. And it wasn't hit with a lot of confrontation. And I think that's important where if you can build that relationship, when you start to provide critiques in a positive manner, I think then it doesn't come back as, as a negative. It's, oh, okay, I see your perspective. That makes sense. Like, let's try to find some common ground here. Great. Well, perfect, Griffin. I, th I think that's all the all the questions we've got in today. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll um, again upload this to the uh, members area sometime next week, uh, where you can see all the other uh, webinars that we've had and um, check out some of the events we have upcoming. We've got a we've got a few few more great speakers coming up, as well as the conference at the end of August. So, thanks again for joining us, and um, once again, thanks, Griffin. And uh, we'll we'll see everyone again soon. Thank you. Thank you.